On tonight's summary of the Israel-Hamas War, Day 188. Hamas spokesperson states that no hostage deal will be reached unless it includes complete ceasefire and idea of withdrawal from the Gaza Strip. Israel has rejected both of these terms. The IDF launches an operation in the central parts of the Gaza Strip, carrying out massive airstrikes and ground offensives around the Al-Nusirat refugee camp. Israel announces opening a new crossing in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip, substantially increasing the amount of aid that will enter that region. Iran continues to threaten retaliation against Israel's attack on the Iranian consulate in Damascus last week. Israel threatens all-out war in response. The United States pledges to stand with Israel if war with Iran erupts. The UK, Germany, France, and other countries are all pressuring Iran to scale down the regional escalations. Hello everyone, I'm Alon Burstein, visiting assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and Israel Institute Fellow with the University of California, Irvine, here bringing you the summary of the last 24 hours of the Israel-Hamas War. It's currently the evening of April 11, 2024 in the United States, the morning of April 12, 2024 in the Middle East. Starting with the hostage situation, while all sides are still awaiting Hamas's official response to the latest proposal that was agreed upon in the Cairo summit, one of Hamas's official spokespeople, Abdel Latif Kanoa, published a statement today in response to the ongoing negotiations, stating, and I quote, The key to any agreement with the occupation is a complete ceasefire. He added that without the ability of Palestinian civilians to return to the northern parts of the Gaza Strip with no restrictions, i.e. no limitations and not going through IDF checkpoints, and without a complete IDF withdrawal from the Gaza Strip, there will be no hostage deal. There are two noteworthy things about the statement that was made by Kaanoa. One is that this is the first statement that he made since October 31st. He and Hazim Qasim are the two spokespeople who remain alive of Hamas, and the fact that he has come out of hiding now in order to make this statement may be important with regards to the different balances of power or who he is representing within the movement. Beyond that, it is also important that while the statement was made and it does echo Hamas's official position and the rejection of the proposed deal thus far, it was not channeled through the official channels in response to the negotiators. Instead, this appears to have been more of a more of a public consumption. The spokesperson came out and said this to the media. However, Hamas has yet to give its official response. All signs are actually still waiting. Regarding this procrastination of Hamas, Israeli officials today were quoted in the Ynet News Agency assessing that Yahya Sinwar, the leader of Hamas in the Gaza Strip, might be stalling on the answer with regards to the hostage deal in anticipation of seeing Iran's retaliation to the Damascus assassination and how the war is going to take shape. Sinwar has been trying to pull the region into a larger conflict. He wanted Hezbollah to join the war, and he has been trying to get Iran and other militias to join the war more in full force, and it is possible that he is hoping that things deteriorate as a result of regional escalations if Iran does retaliate from its own territory, and thus he's procrastinating on the possibility of a truce between Hamas and the IDF until he sees where the wind is blowing. Right now, again, that statement is another pessimistic statement with regards to the potential of a hostage deal, but again, it has to be said, that is not Hamas's official answer. It was said to the media, and that is where it ends. It was not given to the negotiators. Moving on to the Gaza Strip, there were no rockets or mortars that were reported fired from the Gaza Strip targeting Israel in the last 24 hours. Regarding the fighting in the Gaza Strip, the northern parts of the Gaza Strip, there were a series of IDF airstrikes alongside ground operations that were reported in the last 24 hours. In Jabalia refugee camp, Radwan Radwan, the Hamas police chief of the refugee camp, was reportedly assassinated today in an IDF airstrike. This is the third police chief that was assassinated since the war began. Hamas put out a statement later in the day stating that in addition to his police work, Radwan was also in charge of, protect of protecting the different humanitarian aid missions in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip. I will say that while Hamas put that out to say that he was not only a police officer, he was also in charge of humanitarian missions, it is actually quite likely that that is the reason that he was assassinated by the IDF. The IDF systematically in the last several months was assassinating the different Hamas figures who were in charge of the humanitarian aid. Among others, the IDF was stating this is because they are actually diverting aid and stealing it for the movement. However, right now, what is important is this is another police chief who was assassinated. In addition to this, still in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip, in the heart of Gaza City, Al Jazeera reported the IDF airstrike in the Firas open market in the heart of the area. Local reports stated that seven Palestinians were killed in this attack. 
In addition, a major bombing was reported in Gaza City near the Al Ahli Hospital. These are some of the pictures that emerged from the scene. It was not reported by the IDF what was being targeted, or it was not. And in addition to this, it was not reported by Palestinian sources what was the target or how many people were killed in this attack. In addition to this, in Sajaiya, after the Al-Qassam brigades reported attacking IDF troops in the region in the last few days, today the IDF confirmed that ground forces have been operating in that region, and that among others, units have raided Hamas training outposts that were later destroyed in different airstrikes. Other gun, gun battles were also reported in the areas of Sajaiya. Later in the day, the Al-Quds brigades of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad also reported the attacking IDF soldiers in Gaza City, so it is possible that this is in Sajaiya, since it is the only place that the IDF has at least published that it is operating ground forces at this time. In the central parts of the Gaza Strip, the IDF launched an operation in the outskirts of Al Nusirat refugee camp. As has been in the case in the past, the operation began with a series of airstrikes and bombings in the region before the ground forces invaded. Palestinian reports stated that hours before the operation began, there were substantial bombings all around the camp, including a drone attack in the apartment complex of the Al Sahali 2 area, killing several people. It's important to state for context that the IDF has yet to fully invade the central parts of the Gaza Strip. This includes the main refugee camps in the area, including Al Nusirat, Al Buraj, and Al Maghazi, nor has the IDF carried out a major ground invasion in the town of Dir al in the central parts of the Gaza Strip. In all these different areas, Hamas still maintains battalions that are relatively untouched. In addition to that, a lot of Hamas operatives are reportedly to have fled to these areas from both the northern parts in Gaza City and the southern parts from Hanunis, so when the IDF does carry out a full-scale invasion, it is likely to be very intensive. Right now, what is being reported is that the IDF is not carrying out a full invasion of the area, but instead that this is a mission that's supposed to take several days, and that the IDF's intent is to expand the corridors that connect the northern parts of the Gaza Strip to the southern parts of the Gaza Strip, and expand the IDF control of the area, I will add in a moment of commentary, it is possible that this is an anticipation of some sort of truce or ceasefire. The IDF wants to make sure that it maintains larger corridors if and when the fighting does actually come to a pause. In the southern parts of the Gaza Strip, in Rafah, there were several airstrikes that were reported throughout the day. Among these, the most important news that came out of there is the assassination of Nasser Yaqub Jabir Nasser. He is reportedly one of the central figures in the money trafficking of the Al Qassam brigades, and he was assassinated in an airstrike today in Rafah. However, I will say that while the IDF stated that he was assassinated, it did not give any details about when this happened, or in what area of the city, or if anyone else was killed. I will say that earlier in the day there was a bombing that was reported in the eastern parts of Rafah, and later there was also a drone attack that was reported in the El Salim region, also in the eastern parts of Rafah, and five people were reportedly killed in that drone attack. It is possible that this was the assassination of Nasser Nasser, however it is also possible that these are separate attacks. We'll likely find out more about this in the coming days. Regarding casualties, no IDF soldiers were reported killed or injured in the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours, leaving the total number of IDF soldiers killed in the Gaza Strip since the invasion began on 260, and the total number of IDF soldiers injured in the Gaza Strip since the invasion began on 1,560. In turn, the Palestinian Health Ministry in the Gaza Strip is reporting that 63 Palestinians were killed in the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours, bringing the total number of Palestinians killed in the Gaza Strip since the war began to 33,545. 76,094 Palestinians are reported injured in the Gaza Strip since the war began. Moving on to the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip, there were a lot of reports that came in today regarding the different ways in which Israel and the IDF are seemingly trying to respond to the international pressure and demands to increase humanitarian aid and ensure the security of aid workers following the killing of several workers of the World Central Kitchen that occurred last week. Among these, there was a report about increasing coordination between the IDF and the different aid agencies. Reportedly, the IDF general who's in charge of the Southern Command, Yaron Finkelstein, along with the IDF coordinator of activities in Palestinian territories, General Rasan Aliyan, met in the last days with representatives of the different UN agencies, including w meeting with representatives of the Red Cross, USAID, IMC, and the U.S. coordinator of humanitarian affairs. According to the reports, the aim of this meeting was to increase coordination among the different agencies and the IDF to ensure that the mistake that the IDF made in targeting the World Central Kitchen workers will not happen again because there will be more coordination regarding the IDF knowing where the different aid agencies are operating. 
In addition to this, Israel reported today that it is intending on opening a northern land crossing into the Gaza Strip. Contrary to expectations, the announcement uh, stated that a new crossing is going to be opened in the areas of Zikim, rather than refurbishing the Erez crossing that was badly damaged in the October 7th attack. It is not reported exactly when this crossing is going to be open, however, this is one of the main demands that both the United States, the United Kingdom, and the EU have made towards Israel with regards to increasing humanitarian aid into the Gaza Strip to allow aid to flow into the port of Ashdod in Israel and to open a northern crossing so that aid can actually flow into the northern parts of the Gaza Strip directly instead of going through the crossings on the southern part. In addition to this, after I reported yesterday that Israel is planning to reactivate the northern water pipe that allows water to flow from Israel to the Gaza Strip, and also to repair the southern water pipe in the areas of Hanunas that was damaged, today it was reported that that southern water pipe in the area of Bani Suhela has been repaired and that water is going to start flowing through that pipe to the Gaza Strip. In addition to all this, the IDF spokesperson Daniel Hagari also stated today that he expects that the number of aid trucks entering the Gaza Strip each day will soon be up to 500. Again, I will say that President Biden explicitly demanded that the number go up to 500 a day. In addition to this, continuing his statements from yesterday, the IDF coordinator of activities in the Palestinian territories published pictures today, shown here, that show six, over 600 cargo loads of humanitarian aid that have crossed over from Israel and are awaiting pickup on the Palestinian side of the Kerem Shalom crossing. There they are waiting for UN agencies to pick them up and distribute them. He stated that Israel has expanded the hours of the crossings and dramatically increased the aid, adding that this has resulted in a, quote, flooding of the Palestinian side of the crossing with aid in a way that is creating a bottleneck, and he emphasized that the bottleneck is not on Israel's side, but rather it is a result of holdups in distributing the aid on the Palestinian side. Other news related to the humanitarian situation, the Israeli Tzav 9 protest movement that in the past was blocking the different and the different entrances and crossways into the Gaza Strip and stopping aid from coming in, today staged another protest in the Nitzana crossing, blocking the, the trucks from entering the crossing for several hours. This is the first time that the protesters staged, an, staged such an event in the last month. After several hours, they were dispersed and the entrance of trucks resumed. One protester was reportedly arrested. In addition to this, the UN Security Council called upon Israel today to remove all restraints from blocking the flow of humanitarian aid into the Gaza Strip. Several members of the council, including the United States, praised the recent moves of Israel and stated that the situation is improving, however emphasized that more has to be done and that, and that decisions have to be fully implemented. In addition to this, the UN Security Council also called for a full independent investigation into the killing of the workers of the World Central Kitchen. Moving on to the West Bank, there was an attempted Palestinian attack that occurred in the West Bank today. A Palestinian woman arrived in the Al Fawar checkpoint near Hebron, and a knife was found in her possession. Interrogation on site confirmed that she had intended on carrying out an attack and stabbing IDF soldiers on the scene. She was arrested, and no one was injured, and she was taken for interrogation. Other news, substantial IDF activity was reported in several different parts of the West Bank in the last 24 hours. These include the Farah refugee camp, where one Palestinian was killed in confrontation. In addition, there was also substantial activity reported in the al Izaria area, near the Malay Dumim settlement. Substantial weaponry was reportedly confiscated in its operation. Six Palestinians were arrested in the West Bank in the last 24 hours. Moving on to the northern parts of Israel, southern parts of Lebanon, after days of escalation, it was relatively calm in the last 24 hours, both with regards to the firing of rockets by Hezbollah and with regards to IDF retaliation. Hezbollah claimed several different border incidents and shooting attacks that occurred in the last 24 hours. The IDF reported that there was one identification of rockets that were launched by Hezbollah. However, there was no report of any alerts that went off in Israel, so it is possible this rocket landed in the areas of Lebanon. Regarding IDF activity, IDF warplanes reportedly targeted Hezbollah military structure in the areas of Adaharia after identifying Hezbollah operatives had entered it. Pictures were later disseminated showing the three-story building that was attacked and the damage that was done as a result of this airstrike. In addition, other attacks targeted Hezbollah structures in the areas of Misr Jabil, Yarin, and El Hiyam, as well as Hezbollah lookout posts in the areas of Meruchin. Tank fire was also reported in the areas of Tir and artillery fire was also reported in the areas of Abu Shash. However, again, comparing to the escalations that we saw in the last several weeks, today, with regards to casualties, this has been a relatively calm day on the northern front of Israel and the southern front of Lebanon.
Moving on to some of the regional developments, and I include the political developments in this because a lot of the a lot of them cross over between political statements and regional escalations. Most of this relates to gearing up for the possible escalation amidst the expected retaliation of Iran to the attack that occurred in their consulate in Damascus, assassinating their top figures in the Iranian Revolutionary Guards that occurred on April 1st. The Iranian ambassador to the United Nations stated today, and I quote, If the UN Security Council had condemned the vicious Zionist attack against our diplomatic compound in Damascus, and accordingly would have brought justice to, with the, to those who are responsible, Iran would not have to punish the rogue regime itself. So again, this is an explicit threat that Iran is making, that it is going to carry out a retaliation itself, not through one of its militias, targeting Israel. In addition to this, the U.S. General Michael Carrilla, who is the commander of U.S. Central Command, arrived in Israel today and met with IDF Chief of Staff Herzi Alevi. This is a photo of them the last time they met. The two reportedly discussed regional preparations and plans for Iran's attack. In addition, Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant also spoke to U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin discussing the situation. This is the second time that the two have spoken in the last several days, again all in preparation of possible Iranian attack and escalations. France, Germany, and the United Kingdom all issued statements warning Iran against carrying out an attack on Israel. In addition, the U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken reportedly held a marathon conversations with foreign ministers of China, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey, pressuring all of them to pressure Iran to not escalate the region and bring the entire region into all-out war. A senior U.S. official was quoted today in the Haaretz news site stating that the administration expects the Iranian attack to be larger than usual, but not something that will end up involving the United States, i.e. not something that is going to drag the entire region into an escalation. I will say that what has been reported is going to lead to such an escalation as if Iran carries out the attack itself. Israel has repeatedly st stated that if an attack is launched by Iran, then in turn Israel is going to have to retaliate to Iran itself, which is a different level than if an attack is launched by one of the militias and Israel targets against the militias. So right now, it remains to be seen what exactly is going to happen and if it is going to drag the United States and more broadly the region into a war. Later in the day, amidst all these diplomatic warnings, and in, and in addition to President Biden's warning yesterday that the United States will intervene if Iran does attack, Reuters quoted Iranian officials today stating that Iran has signaled to the United States that its retaliation is going to be measured and will avoid regional escalation. According to the report, Iran's foreign minister conveyed the messages through regional partners and also conveyed Iran's desire to restart negotiations on the nuclear program and to de-escalate the region, however emphasized this is contingent upon a ceasefire being reached in the Gaza Strip. In addition, the report stated that Iran was seeking assurances that the United States would not retaliate if Iran's retaliation against Israel, quote, was measured. However, the United States reportedly rejected this. Again, the United States has said that if Iran carries out the retaliation itself, then likely Israel is going to retaliate and the United States may participate in Israel's activities. Amidst all this, in a very rare move, the United States today instructed its diplomatic staff and their families who are in Israel to not venture out of the areas of Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, or Be'er Sheva. In addition, the embassy statement also added that more restrictions may be applied soon contingent upon developments. Russia also issued warnings to its citizens to avoid visiting Israel, the Palestinian Authority, or Lebanon in light of regional escalations. Amidst all these reports regarding the Iran's deliberations, if they are going to carry out the retaliation themselves or use one of their militias, it was also reported today that Syrian President Bashar Assad refused to allow Iran's retaliation to be launched from Syria, likely anticipates that if that, that is launched from Syria, Israel's retaliations will, will be much harsher rather than if they are launched from somewhere else. Remains to be seen if Iran actually lives up to that. Syria does not really have the capability of compelling Iran to not do that. Remains to be seen. So, just to summarize where things stand, in Israel, there is seemingly anticipation that this retaliation is going to come in the coming days. There are reports that the government has been bracing the military as well as local councils, instructing local council leaders to both prepare emergency shelters and be prepared for emergency measures that may be taken at any moment. The United States is ordering its diplomats to stay only in big cities and is issuing warnings against Iran, so everyone is braced for this big retaliation that may be the final spark in the powder keg of a regional war on the one hand. 
On the other hand, this immense diplomatic pressure seems to also be paying off to some extent. There are different reports that Iran is trying to signal to the United States that it is not looking for a regional escalation. There's even reports that Iran is hoping to reignite some sort of talks with the United States about the nuclear deal or something else. Again, this may be Iran trying to entice the United States more put more pressure on Israel to reach a ceasefire. Remains to be seen. We're going to learn more about this in the coming days. All the intelligence reports in the last week estimated that the retaliation will be within the next week or two. So we will see. Possibly there will be things this weekend. Obviously, I will report more about this as it develops. If you find these reports important, please do remember to hit that like button, subscribe, turn on notifications if you want to know when reports come out. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. That is my report for the last 24 hours. I'll be back tomorrow.